Welcome back to Jack Sports. My name is Jacob Kelly, and this is a show where we take you through the biggest stories in sports that you might have missed this week. The NBA Finals got underway Thursday, and the Golden State Warriors rolled through the Cleveland Cavaliers 113-91. It was a great game by the Warriors, a statement game for Durant. He went off for 38 points, 8 rebounds, and 8 assists, and they just outplayed the Cavs. The Cavs played terrible in this game. They couldn't take care of the basketball. They turned it over 20 times. Their bench also got outplayed by Golden State, which I did not expect. They also lost the battle in the paint to Golden State, which I did not expect. The amount of second chance points Golden State had was ridiculous, and you can't do that against a team that's as good. A lot of people have this series written off already. They have Golden State taking it easily. But don't forget, a series doesn't start until someone loses at home. And I think Golden State's going to lose on Sunday night. I have the Cavaliers winning this one. I don't think LeBron James is going to let them get blown out like they did on Thursday. If you aren't a fan of this Cavs-Warriors matchup, I have some bad news for you. I don't see Cleveland not making it to the finals anytime soon. The East is too easy, and the only way I see them not making it is if guys team up on one team in order just to stop LeBron. But I don't see that happening, especially for the next couple of years. And Jeff Van Gundy, the former coach in the ESPN and ABC broadcasters, says he can see the Golden State Warriors going to 8-10 to 10 straight finals. The last team to go to 10 straight finals is the Boston Celtics. They went from 1957 to 1966. The Golden State Warriors are already three finals in, so that means they'd be in the finals for seven more years after this. And if they want that to happen, it's very important that they keep that core four together. They keep Steph, KD, Draymond, and Clay all on the same team. Kevin Durant has already said he's willing to take a pay cut to make sure that those guys stay together. But one other important thing to note is durability. LeBron James has been to seven straight finals, and a big part of that is his durability. The guy doesn't get injured. KD and Steph already have a history of injuries. In seven years, they will be 36 and 35 respectively, and... I don't see a scenario where both these guys stay 100% healthy over the course of the next seven postseasons. The only team with a chance at stopping the Cleveland Cavaliers anytime soon is the Boston Celtics. They don't have enough now. They need to add a couple more pieces. And someone else that realizes that is Isaiah Thomas. He's willing to delay contract extension talks in order for the team to add high quality free agents and add that other piece that they need to get past LeBron James. I think this is a great team move by Isaiah. The only thing is it's a little bit risky. If he does push off back his contract extension and they end up bringing in a big free agent piece, but they also draft Markel Fultz and Fultz turns out to be just as good as everyone says he is, what's the need in keeping Isaiah an undersized, ball-centric, poor defensive point guard? You can't win championships with ball-centric point guards, and we've seen that with Isaiah, with John Wall, with Russell Westbrook. Even in this playoffs, after Isaiah went down, the Boston Celtics played better team offensive basketball and then up beating the Cavaliers, something they couldn't do when Isaiah was there. So I think it's just risky on Isaiah's part that if the team ends up being good and they don't need him anymore, there's a chance he could screw himself out of a contract. And I know it would suck if the Celtics didn't re-sign him after next season when his contract's up. But at the end of the day, this is a business and you have to do what you have to do to win basketball games. Speaking of NBA contracts, did you hear who's going to likely sign for a max deal this offseason? Nerlens Noel. You heard that right. Nerlens Noel, if he re-signs in Dallas, will fetch $146 million over five years. And if he signs elsewhere, he'll make $108 million over five years. Now, full disclosure, I am a Kentucky fan. I like Kentucky players in the NBA, but I know Nerlens Noel is not worth this amount of money. He averages 10 points, 7.5 rebounds a game, and he's a good paint defender. And if he gets switched to the perimeter, he can hold his own out there. But he is not worth a max deal. He has a history of injuries, so signing him to a max deal is way too risky. I will be shocked if the Dallas Mavericks re-sign him to a deal. I think they're a better run organization than that. If he signs a max deal this offseason, I would not be surprised if it's with a poorly run organization like the Sacramento Kings or the Brooklyn Nets. We are two games into the NHL Finals, and the Pittsburgh Penguins have a 2-0 series lead. At the time of recording this video, Game 3 goes tonight in Nashville. P.K. Subban has guaranteed a win, and it is a must-win game for the Predators. They cannot go down 3-0 to the Pittsburgh Penguins. Two things need to happen from Nashville for them to win this series, and just this game. They need to find Pekka Rinne, because I have no idea where he's been for the first two games of this series, and they have to make it much more physical. When they played Anaheim, it was an all-out war, and I have not seen that in the first two games of the Stanley Cup Finals. They've been a little bit softer than they were in that series, Pittsburgh is pretty banged up, so I think if Nashville really brings a bye to them, it could open up a lot of chances for them. Washington Capitals GM Brian McClellan spoke to the media for the first time since the Caps lost in the second round of the playoffs to the Pittsburgh Penguins, and when asked about a potential trade of Alexander Ovechkin, he said that that doesn't make sense from an organizational point of view. However, he did go on to say that maybe at some point if there's a legitimate hockey deal that came available, but I don't know if that's where we're at right now. 
Personally, I don't think Ovechkin is going to be traded. I think what you would have to give up in return for Ovechkin would be way too great. I think there's a higher chance of Ovechkin playing in a KHL jersey before he plays in a different NHL jersey. If you missed the video where I talked about the possibility of Alexander Ovechkin jumping ship to go play in the KHL, I'll link to that video in the description down below. Tiger Woods was arrested for a DUI. Up your left foot. All right, make your right foot, heel touch your toe. Tiger was arrested on Monday at around 3 o'clock in the morning by the Jupiter Police Department. And when I saw his mugshot, I went, yeah, he looks pretty rough. It's holiday weekend, probably just driving home, had a little bit too much to drink, and he got caught. But Tiger Woods went out and said that alcohol was not involved. He released the following statement. I understand the severity of what I did, and I take full responsibility for my actions. I want the public to know that alcohol was not involved. What happened was an unexpected reaction to prescribed medications. I didn't realize the mix of medication had affected me so strongly. The Jupiter Police Department seemed to back up this statement by announcing that Tiger Woods blew a 0.00 on the breathalyzer test that was administered to him that morning. That means there was no alcohol in his system. They found him pulled over on the side of the road asleep at the wheel. When he got out, he was very cooperative. They administered some sobriety tests to him and he failed every single one. But honestly, I can't fault Tiger Woods on this one. It was an un I believe him when he said it was an unexpected reaction to prescription medication. He did pull over on the side of the road, but he was asleep at the wheel. But I just I can't fault him on this one. I think he gets a pass. Conor McGregor will be in a boxing match. We just don't know with who yet. A deal has been reached with the McGregor camp for this fight. The UFC is still working on a deal with the Mayweather camp, but if negotiations fall through with Floyd Mayweather, there's another boxing legend that is willing to step in to fight Conor McGregor. Manny Pacquiao. Pacquiao's promoter Bob Arum said the following state. Pacquiao's got a tough fight, a really tough fight against this guy in Australia, Jeff Horn. After that fight on July 1st, if McGregor is still looking for an opponent, Manny Pacquiao is there. Out of those two guys, I think Manny Pacquiao would be a better fight to watch. I think if he fights Floyd, it's going to end up a lot like the Floyd-Pacquiao fight. It's going to be very defensive, and I think Floyd would win that one. With the Pacquiao fight, though, I think McGregor would have a better shot at winning, and it would be a much better product. I think we would see these two guys stay in the ring, right in the middle, trade blows, be very offensive, and they would just lead to a better product and be more enjoyable to watch. No matter who fights Conor McGregor, this is a bad deal for boxing, but a great deal for the UFC. If Conor loses, well, whatever, he's fighting a professional boxer, of course he's going to lose. But if Conor wins, that means the UFC now has better fighters, it's a better brand, better product, because even the UFC stars can beat the best and the best of boxing. One thing I do think that will happen, though, if Conor wins, is we will see more boxers stepping up, challenging McGregor to a fight, almost to defend the honor of boxing. From what I've seen, there's been no response to the Pacquiao camp yet. Dana White said that he's still working on negotiations with Floyd Mayweather, and it would make the most sense if there was a 50-50 split between the two fighters. ESPN released its Fame 100 list. This list takes in the top 100 most famous athletes from around the world. They use a formula developed by ESPN Director of Sports Analytics Ben Alomar, and it weighs an athlete's Twitter following, Instagram following, Facebook following, Google search popularity, and endorsement money. They take those five criteria and they put it into the formula, and that is how they determine the top 100 most famous athletes around the world. A few things to know with this list is it is a worldwide list. It's not just focused on North America and North American sports, and it also doesn't factor in retired athletes, so Tony Romo will not appear on this list, and it doesn't factor in amateur athletes. You won't see Lonzo Ball on this list. I mean, I don't think you'd see him anyways, but this list does not factor in amateur athletes. The top 10 for this list are as follows. Number one, Cristiano Ronaldo. Number two, LeBron James. Number three, Lionel Messi. Number four, Roger Federer. Number five, Phil Mickelson. Six, Neymar. Seven, Usain Bolt. Eight, Kevin Durant. Nine, Rafael Nadal. And 10, Tiger Woods. You'll notice with this top 10, there isn't a single NFL, NHL, or MLB player. The first NFL on this list is Tom Brady, and he comes in at number 21. And there isn't a single MLB or NHL player in the top 100 most famous athletes. I'll link to the entire list down below. I just thought this was really cool. I think the criteria is fair on this list, but it is a worldwide list. So I was looking through it and there's some names I've never even heard of. And I just thought that was so interesting that I consider myself to be a pretty big sports fan and I don't know the top 100 most famous athletes in the world. The NFL might be going into a lockout in the 2021 season. The NFLPA 
warned all players to start saving for a potential lockout in the 2021 season. They did this because back in 2011, the NFLPA had to sign the collective bargaining agreement prior to the preseason starting because players hadn't saved enough and they could not go on without receiving their game checks. In my opinion, four years lead up is more than enough time to warn players that they have to start saving their money now. If they can't save their money in four years, that's their own fault. One other small detail with the story is we the fans might be losing out on football games because the NFL might go into a lockout if they can't sign a new collective bargaining agreement before the 2021 season. Despite the upcoming move to Las Vegas in 2020, the Oakland Raiders have sold out their season tickets for the upcoming season. I'm not surprised by this. The Oakland Raiders have such a strong fan base and it'd be dumb if they sat through years of struggle with the Raiders only to not go and get season tickets when the team gets good. I honestly think they could be a Super Bowl contender this year. Speaking of the Oakland Raiders, longtime Raider fan Ice Cube had his four point shot challenge to LeVar Ball accepted. Two, what up boy? West Coast baby, you triple B. We are gonna accept that challenge man. But if I make this shot before you make it, you gotta buy my whole travel ball team which is 14 people the Z02s. If you missed this story, I talked about it in last week's video. And last week it was 10 shoes. LeVar responded with 14 shoes, and that still is only $6,930. $6,930 is not a lot of money, especially for someone like Ice Cube. And like I said last week, I think this is very smart. People are going to tune in. LeVar Ball has been talking the talk all year, and people want to see if he can walk the walk, if he can hit that shot. And I think $7,000 for the amount of people that is going to be tuning in to see this is a great deal for Ice Cube and he's gonna do so much publicity for his new league, the Big Three. Speaking of the Ball family, Lonzo Ball's workout with the Los Angeles Lakers is booked. It's booked for this upcoming Wednesday, June 7th. Of course, he has told the Boston Celtics that he will not be working out with them. There's been no update as to whether he will be working out with the Philadelphia 76ers or not. One other thing with Lonzo Ball, his dad, LeVar, lost him $10 million. Lonzo was offered shoe deals by Nike, Under Armour, and Adidas for $10 million over five years. That equates to around $2 million a year. It was also reported that if Lonzo gets drafted to the Lakers, which he likely will, that deal would double to $20 million. But let's just keep it at $10 million because that's what each brand is going to offer him, Nike, Adidas, and Under Armour. So $10 million over five years is $2 million a year. $2 million a year equates to just over 4,000 pairs of his Zo 2 Prime shoes. So... Yeah, $10 million is a lot, $2 million a year. But when you break it down, and he has the possibility to overpass that with his own brand. Like I said, only 4,000 pairs of the shoes. They sold around 500 as of a couple weeks ago. That definitely could have doubled by now. And when Lonzo gets drafted to the NBA, as I said, likely by the Lakers, and if he starts playing well, those shoes could start moving a lot quicker, as well as the rest of his apparel and his other shoes, the flip-flops. So realistically, I think he can make more money on his own with this and that is just fascinating to me that they're actually have a shot at pulling this off. Lonzo Ball may not have signed with one of these big brands but another big point guard in the upcoming draft De'Aaron Fox has. It's reported that he signed a multi-year deal with Nike. No figures have been released yet so we don't know how much he's making but John Wall came out and said that De'Aaron Fox is going to be the best point guard coming out of this draft. He was a highly sought after endorsement deal by these major brands and it's going to be interesting to see his career versus Lonzo. These two guys had a bit of a rivalry this year in college when UCLA met Kentucky. People are trying to compare the two for the upcoming draft this year. Who's the better point guard? People are going to tune in when these guys play each other. I think this is going to be a new rivalry in the NBA, and I think it's going to be a good one. The D-League is no more. It has officially been renamed the G-League, the NBA Gatorade League. As a result of this deal, there's the new league name. There's going to be a new league logo, and players are going to have access to Gatorade products, equipment, any new innovations that the company makes. And I think this is cool, but if we're being completely honest, I didn't tune into the D-League and I'm probably not going to turn into the G-League either. NBA Commissioner Adam Silver was on the herd with Colin Coward this week when he said that the NBA was reconsidering the one and done rule. When I heard this, I assumed that he meant that they were looking to raise the age limit to 20 so that players would have to go two years in college before they could enter the NBA draft. I was wrong. The NBA is actually considering to lower the age restriction for the NBA and allow players to come in at 18 straight of high school like it used to before they raised it to 19. When he was on the herd, Commissioner Silver said the following. What's happening now, even at the best schools, they enroll in those universities, some great universities, and they attend those universities until either they don't make the tournament in the last game, therefore of their freshman seasons, or they lose or win in the NCAA tournament. That becomes their last day. So in essence, it's a half and done, half a school year, and they go on. 
Commissioner Silver also went on to say that he worries about the stunted development of these players going to college and referenced Ben Simmons as an example, how he went to LSU, didn't make the tournament, and still went number one overall in the draft last year. I would argue that if we let more players come out of high school directly into the NBA, it'll harm their development more than if they went to college. Because even we're seeing now, other than the best of the best players coming into the draft, a lot of these guys aren't getting big minutes. They're deep in the depth chart, and that can hurt their development more than going to college. In college, you're going to be getting big minutes and playing more, which can benefit their development. There are some great schools in the NCAA which provide fantastic development opportunities for players. Schools like Kentucky, Duke, Kansas, UNC. If you think a player is going to have poor development going under Coach K at Duke, you're crazy. There is fantastic developmental opportunities for these players going into college. But if we go back to Adam Silver's example of Ben Simmons going to LSU and getting poor development, that was his choice. He had the capability to go to Kansas and play for a great program and a great coach, but he chose not to. And if we look at Markel Fultz, the Ben Simmons comparison this year, the consensus number one overall pick, best player in the draft, doesn't make it to the NCAA tournament. He had offers from Louisville, Arizona, UNC, Virginia, but he chose to go to Washington. It was his choice that he went to a poor program and didn't go where the great developmental opportunities are. And another argument for players developing better in the NBA than the NCAA, let's just look at Tyus Jones. Two years ago, he played under Coach K at Duke as a freshman. When they went, they won the NCAA championship. Since then, he was drafted 24th overall by the Minnesota Timberwolves, and he's been held deep in their depth chart ever since. He would have developed much better under Coach K at Duke if he'd returned to the NCAA and played a year or two more than getting drafted and playing with Minnesota. So what do we do with the one and done rule in order to better benefit our players? I have two ideas. The first idea is to do the NBA draft similar to the NHL draft. Allow players to enter the draft and be drafted by a team, but if they aren't good enough, they don't sign a professional contract to maintain their amateur status, which will allow them to be eligible to return and play in the NCAA. This will not be a wasted pick for the team that drafted them though, as as they send this player back to the NCAA, they still are considered to have that player's rights. So after that player spends another year or two in the NCAA and develops further, the team that drafted them and only the team that drafted them can call that player up to play for their team. This allows the best players to begin playing right away, and for those that aren't ready to make the NBA, they can be sent down to develop further, as opposed to being drafted, not making an NBA team, being sent down to the D-League and burning out in a couple of years with no education, and really not much money left as they won't get paid as well in the D-League. Additionally, if they get sent back to school and they aren't even good enough to get called back up to the NBA, they still have been at a post-secondary institution, most likely a very good one, and have earned a degree at a school which will allow them to get another professional job outside of basketball. I've also heard the idea of extending the age of the D-League to 16 to allow the best young players to come in and play with the D-League players. I still don't necessarily agree with those as you're still having boys playing men and it could stunt their development if they're not getting as many minutes as they would if they went and played at college. So here's what I'm proposing as my second idea. The NBA have its own junior development league. This league will be for 16 to 20 year olds. It will feature the best 16 to 20 year olds in the country and it will be a good way to prepare them for the NBA. For 16 to 17 year olds, they will not be paid. This will allow them to maintain their amateur status, which will allow them to go to the NCAA prior to entering the NBA draft if that's the route they want to choose. Additionally, they will also receive a full educational component, which will allow them to obtain their high school diploma. There will also be an educational component for all players. It will not be your standard high school learning experience. It will be preparing them for life in the NBA. They'll be learning how to deal with finances, the rough travel schedule, being a star, social media, everything that they need to prepare for life in the league. This league will not be big. It is designed for the best players in the country. I'm looking at 10 teams, 120 players, five teams on the East Coast, five on the West Coast. Teams will play one to three games a week, one or two games within their own coast, close games during the week. And then on the weekends, they'll fly cross country to play another team on the opposite coast. This will slowly amalgamate them and get them acclimatized to the travel schedules of the NBA. As I said, this league is for ages 16 to 20. If the draft rules stay the same and the suggestion I had previously is not implemented, then this will allow players age 16 and 17 to go to the NCAA once they finish this league and they're eligible to play in the NCAA. For those players that went to the NCAA, get drafted but don't crack a roster, they can be sent down to the junior league and develop there playing against the best talent within their age group as opposed to being sent down to the D league. To summarize that whole idea, the NBA creates a junior league for the best 16 to 20 year old talent in the country to develop by playing against the best young players. With this, they'll also be learning to how to prepare for life in the NBA and they'll remain their amateur status if they choose to enroll and go play in the NCAA. 
If not, and they choose to enter the NBA draft and they get drafted, but they aren't quite good enough to make a roster yet, they can be sent back to the Junior League. Thank you once again for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Make sure you let me know in the comment section down below your opinion on anything I talk about today. I really want to know what you think the NBA should do with the one and done rule. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, follow me on social, and I'll see you next week.